So welcome to the Unit 2 Overview for NGSS Chemistry. Um, we're going to go ahead and just do a quick summary of the adjustments that were made for distance learning. Then we're going to over review the unit planner and walk through the unit. Uh, I'm going to remind you of some resources to support you. Uh, then we're going to have some time for collaboration so that uh, we can, and some suggestions for how you might use that collaboration time might be to discuss like how you, what kind of organizer you're going to use, discern asynchronous or synchronous lessons, talk about how you might modify things for your particular student group. And then I'm going to have uh, some questions at the end. All right. So in our unit two, that we've changed a few things. So the original, uh, originally the order was we're going to do what gold makes gold so valuable. That hasn't really changed a whole lot except for some pieces have been moved to the interactive student notebook to make it easier for students to explore and comment on those. The create a table was originally an activity that was done on paper and that's been moved to a Jamboard uh, for that. What makes a stable element was a FET simulation and that remains a FET simulation that students can work on. The metals, non-metals and weighted averages, uh, that was in there and that sort of stayed as an activity people can do. Because we can't do the flame test lab in person for distance learning, we have moved that to reviewing videos, but you can also do the in-person version where you're in a lab and, and doing the flame test on that. And you can look at that on the other version of the unit planner. And then the periodic trends is still a Google Sheets activity and that's in there. Then we have the test. And uh, for those people who are doing distance learning, we've replaced the battery engineering with jewelry engineering. It's more of a research project with simulations rather than battery engineering, which is a hands-on wet lab. And the ones that are there for the non-distance learning, if you're still teaching in person, are available on the PMSP website. Now, this is our unit organizer, and this is what it looks like for the distance learning piece. And um, this is just a picture of it. And if I click on it, it allows me to go into that unit organizer. And this is set up so that if you get a copy of the slides, you can make your own copy of it um, here. And that way, if you decide you need to make some changes, you can do so. Now, in this interactive notebook, uh, in this distance learning uh, methodology, what we have here is we've got this student interactive notebook. And I'm going to go ahead and open that so that we can talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And that's going to be what students download and do some of their work in, in the interactive notebook. So uh, as I go through the assignments, you'll see there are different task sets that we're talking about. Each task set has a link to go to it. And there are different words that they can use as a word wall to define as they go through this, because uh, according to the most recent stuff that they were talking about in the OSTA conference and as recent literature has said, learning those definitions as we go through, uh, learning them in context, and then using that context to make definitions is, is sort of the better way to go. So that's kind of why we have that up here as, as we you learn new words and introduce them and talk about them in common language, students can go through and define them up here at the top. Then they have the, uh, a sort of a, a, just a way for students to track their own learning in here. And then it goes through and goes through the different, the different task sets. Now, uh, I'm going to go back into that unit planner that I just had a second ago so that I can walk through what those tasks are and sort of how we're managing that in um, that unit planner. So here is the distance planner that I went ahead and was looking at. I think I'm going to stop sharing just to make sure that I'm sharing the right thing at this point, because sometimes if I'm sharing one particular piece, it doesn't always go, go through on Zoom. So here is our interactive, uh, our distance planner. The first thing, and there's the standards that are going with it. The first thing is talking about uh, gold. So why is gold uh, so valuable? So that's not this first piece. Why is gold so valuable? We're going to talk about explaining the properties of gold. And this is really focused in on what is it about that element, the properties of that element that make it so desirable. Now there is a slideshow to go through that phenomenon that ends with the thinking about not only does it figure out what's going on um, with pictures 
to explain what's happening. And many of those pictures are mirrored in the interactive notebook so people, students can see the picture and make what they notice and what they're um, wondering about those pictures uh, to the side. And at the end, you do a question generating Jamboard where students can go in and write their questions and then you can move those questions around in an order so that they can see what, what's generated from that. So if I go back just really quickly to that interactive notebook, this is what I'm talking about. You can see pictures. What do you notice? What do you wonder? There's some pictures about like this has got gold and the other elements that are there are silicon and oxygen. And what are you seeing that's different about those elements versus what you see in that picture? There's a, a video that talks about why gold is so valuable that they can link on. And the link has been put in the interactive notebook because sometimes it's a little difficult to get links to play correctly across the, the Zoom. So that's easier for them to get to. Then students talk about like their precious items. There's a, a picture of gold in water because I can give you a picture of that. And there's a Mythbusters episode about what happens if I put sodium, a different element in water. And then there's asked to talk about the difference between them. And that video is about five minutes long. And that's that unit introduction. That's task set one. If I go back into here, that's going to be that first part. And then the next part is this create a table activity. Now there are slides to go through with that. Uh, and then pieces of this are put in the interactive notebook. So I'm going to show you what some of those look like. So in the interactive notebook, there's this Jamboard template and this slide show so they could go through the slides themselves. And I'm going to click on the Jamboard template here to sort of show you what's going on with some of that. They'll be required to make their own copy. So this can be assigned either as synchronous or asynchronous work. Um, I got to get my computer to decide to let me into that Jamboard. So it's waiting for Jamboard right now to make the copy. And uh, once it does, it makes that copy. And so what they are doing is you've got four elements that are all in one column. And this is similar to what was happening when we did the paper activities. You were given like paper slips with these. And they're asked to talk about like, what do they notice that's similar and different? And they're gonna wind up, you can put their notes on here, and then they're gonna translate those back into uh, their interactive notebook. Now the next slide of this Jamboard is looking at one entire row. And now this is not necessarily reflected in the, in the notebook because I just want them to sort of look through and see what's going on. And there, the idea is you would take these and you'd be able to sort of move around the pieces and maybe put them in some sort of order based on some pieces that the students can notice. So this is just one, call, one row so they can see what's happening in the Jamboard and look at that, what's going on there. Once they've sort of seen the patterns here, the next piece to this Jamboard is they're organizing whole columns by whatever they used a minute ago. So they can go through and say like, oh, a minute ago I organized a column by the number of spikes maybe. And so then I can take this whole column of things and put this spikes over here and arrange them here. And what it's asking for you to do in the interactive notebook is listed here across the bottom. So in the interactive notebook, you've done the one, the secondary sort is when you're doing whole columns and you can start looking at what you see as patterns along there. Now, when I teach this in a, a, in a synchronous class, I put people in breakout rooms to talk about like what that order or what that might be. If you're doing this as an asynchronous class, then I would say have them stop here and then start off at the beginning of class with this piece here of uh, what did they notice and what did they wonder. Now, uh, in their interactive notebook, they're doing uh, products of missing elements. And we hadn't done this before when we originally wrote this, but I'm gonna recommend that for you, one idea that you could do is you could have them write this in their interactive notebook or another possibility, and I'm gonna stop sharing so I can switch over to a different uh, tab on my computer, is you could create some kind of go formative as a beginning entrance ticket to uh, the next class. So give me one second while I pull that up again, uh, as my computer has decided that I don't want that one. And I can show you what that uh, formative might look like. And if you wanna play around with it for a minute, you can do that. Actually, let me... Uh,
a lot of things, but I had that uh, set up a second ago, but for some reason, uh, I'm, there we go. So what you could do with that if you wanted something a little more interactive is to, I'm going to share my screen again with that go formative on there is to pretend, potentially make a go formative where there's like one question that you would assign to your students and that they can go in here. So if I, if I look at this question with the eyes of a student, then what I'm going to have is here are my empty boxes. I'm going to be able to come in here and add some spikes to them. I can add some background to it. I can come in here and add my mass. Uh, so that you could, and then if you're as a teacher are doing this a go formative at the beginning of class or at the end of class, you can then see what all your students are doing at the same time to sort of experience what that looks like. So that's what I will be doing as a modification for my class because we didn't have this available before. And if any of you want some assistance at the end of class on how you might do that or what that might look like at the end of this session, we can do that as well. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and go back to um, that Jamboard. And um, in that Jamboard that we have, the next slide is also asking them to do it in the Jamboard. So you could also the, the, the next thing after what we do when we make those elements that's listed right here is talking about hydrogen and helium. And they're a little small right here to see. Students can make them bigger if they need to uh, in their interactive notebook. But in the Jamboard, you can see the slightly bigger version of, hey, what group would you put these in and why based on sort of what's going on here. Now, these don't have the backgrounds because we felt like the backgrounds gave them sort of too much of a hint about what, what column they might be in. So they kind of left that background off in this particular case. That was some feedback we got uh, that it would be better to do that. So that's the create a table activity uh, in the Jamboard and what that looks like in Jamboard versus as a paper activity. The next activity is the build an atom FET. So in that build an atom FET, if I go back into that interactive notebook, it predominantly, oh, it, I forgot. It, you, and also you want to bring people back together to sort of talk about what the metals and the non-metals are. And that kind of comes from the slides themselves. So the next one is this uh, Jamboard, not Jamboard, this interactive FET on what uh, makes, uh, how to do a build an atom activity. And there's some slides in here you can do here. There's a board meeting discussion. The idea is that they're going to go through this FET simulation. And uh, I would probably make a modification to make the FET simulation linked specifically into the interactive notebook. But if you don't have that uh, link, it's pretty easy. You can always just have them type in build and add um, FET. And that will lead them into this build and add them FET activity. Now this is an HTML5 activity, which means it runs on Chromebooks. And in that activity, what they're asked to do is to go through the atom part and they're going to open up the net charge, the mass number, and the stable or unstable. And they're just going to go through and play around with what makes atoms stable or what can I do that makes them unstable? How can I play that? It also goes through and asks them to identify what causes this uh, symbol up here to change. So at the, this is, uh, so they can see that as I add protons, that changes. They're asked to look at like what changes the charge. And so I, as I add electrons or as I add protons, you can see that that's adding pluses or minuses. And it's asked them to look at sort of the mass number. So you'll see as I add, neutrons or protons, that changes the mass number as well. The biggest thing that we often see with this is that students forget to unlock these and they forget to put the stable or unstable. So you'll want to make sure that they do that because if I reset this to the beginning, you'll see that those are closed and this is unchecked. And if you leave it unchecked, then students will never be able to tell that things are stable or unstable. So that's like the most common mistakes I see that teach that students make as they go through this activity. Going back into uh, this, so they go through that and they do this data discussion template. So let me uh, show you sort of what that looks like. So here, the board meeting discussion, what we're doing in that board meeting discussion and the way that I've run this 
uh, with uh, the unit one's uh, activities is we have everyone in class sort of comes into this board meeting data discussion. And you break them into breakout rooms and try to get your breakout rooms to be about four members. And so each member of the group would be a different person. So if I'm gonna start using people from this, I might put this one, maybe it'll let me edit this. It's not letting me edit it right now. Uh, probably because of the link that I had it wanted to do differently or because I'm sharing. So you're going to have each person will type in a different color. So maybe Alicia will type in red or Kyla will type in blue or Stephanie will type in purple or Kendall will type in pink. And as you go through, you're going to answer these questions. So here's like a graph that you might have. Your students will go into Desmos and create these graphs and paste their graphs in here so they can compare the graphs with each other. Then group one will put all their responses here. Group two will put all their responses here. And so you'll see things of different colors in each row. And that allows them to sort of comment and have a discussion where they're sort of talking to each other and putting their words in here. And you can monitor student progress and say, oh, look, I've noticed breakout room four doesn't seem to be making progress. I can go back in and join and check on them. They look for first, they look for similarities, then they look for differences. That's the common way that we do board meetings start off in classrooms. And then they're gonna talk about what does a Y intercept mean? Um, and what do you think that means? And you can go in and touch in with breakout rooms about, does it make sense? Can I have a, an add of like, what is that zero? That zero means like it's the, the, the atomic number. So if I don't have an atomic number, do I have an atom? Does it make sense to have a negative one? Can I have negative particles? So hopefully with this, you're hoping to get them to the idea that it's not possible to have a negative particle. So it's not really an atom. Now here, you're going to go back into the patterns and this is part of helping them write their conclusion for this. They're going to go through and look at their data and say like, okay, as X doubles, does Y stay constant? Does Y double? Does it double with an offset or does it go the inverse? And so they should go through and do that data answer this piece right here. Each group should have their own set of rows so they can go through and answer what pattern are we seeing. How do we go from understanding our data to making a prediction? So the idea behind this is you'd want them to sort of think about using their equation and whether or not they're within the range of their equation and what would be different about other kinds of scenarios. We explain your slope, what your slope means in your own words. That's basically just having them go through that every time I add a proton that I need to add between one and two neutrons. That's kind of what we're looking for there. Uh, and then what's the relationship between the subatomic particles in a stable nucleus? Putting them to come through here and say, basically protons and neutrons, if they have the right ratio are stable. And if there are uh, too many protons or too many neutrons, that leads us to an unstable element. So that's what is in that data discussion template. And they would go through that and then they would start going through and answering these questions in their interactive notebook. And the actual lab template is asking them to make a prediction in those slides about um, and each student should have their own lab template uh, there. And they're supposed to go through and then make a prediction as to whether or not, so this is the data that they would have gotten for independent and dependent variable. You would say like your protons and your neutrons and your electrons. This is the data they're gonna get from that simulation. And then at the end, they're gonna write a conclusion for, um, and you can go through and have them do this data as well about what would happen with the different kinds of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So that's what this activity looks like. And hopefully with the 12 protons, they can make a, a reasonable guess. And I would expect them with the 60 or the 222, these masses, cobalt is 27, that's way beyond our limit. So they should be getting closer to the predicted data is near or the predicted data is far and then started to getting to a smaller and smaller amount of confidence for that. Okay. Um, after they do that, uh, one of the key things that's important for students to be able to work on bonding is also, so stability will be important for nuclear, which is unit three. Bonding, it's important for them to get a sense of uh, metals versus nonmetals. If you have access to Pogels, this is the Pogel that you would use if you don't have access. This is a, a free collaborative version 
of that. And that's talking about what makes an atom an ion. It also goes into what separates metals from non-metals so they can kind of uh, get that a little bit further in their mind around there. The weighted atomic mass is playing with a simulation um, to try to get uh, an idea of what atomic mass is. There's this practice where you're sort of playing with it and looking at uh, how much of each one you have, the idea around like, okay, this means for every hundred atoms and one of them will be this and 99 is this, and that can get them back to that weighted average idea, uh, which will get us back to the uh, average atomic masses for things on the periodic table. These are additional ideas you can do if you need some extensions for students, which sometimes I do. This is uh, going through the alkali metals. Now, because some people are not able to meet in person, if you could meet in person, the flame test lab is one of my students' favorites. You, you soak some either toothpicks in some different solutions that have different metal ions and put them in the Bunsen burner to see what they look like or you take some metal sticks and put them with some crystals on. Uh, since you can't do that in person, uh, what we've got here as a distance learning option is that there are some sources where you can see other people doing videos of what they look like. And then it talks through, and it's taking a moment to load because we're doing a presentation about like, what are, this, what are the spectrum look like? and then the color of each metal. There's a video that goes through and it talks about those ions are. You, you say what the ion name is, you look at the flame color, that's kind of mimicking what we did in the class, and then predict the, the flame color for some unknown substances. And then there's some evidence from this video to determine flame color. So you could go through here and then there's a, like a little bit more detailed case study as sort of for your exceed students to kind of go more in depth about how you use this act, this kind of uh, lab in order to determine what contaminants are in different places. So this is a, a medical related one for that. The next uh, activity uh, is electron configuration. I would recommend this as being sort of more of a asynchronous activity with a little bit of synchronous support. So the way that I'll be teaching it to my students is that I'll give them this and then I'll suggest hey, for my asynchronous time, I'll make available about a 20 minute piece so that I can talk through the parts that they don't get once they've read this article and then uh, practice writing electron configurations. Now, uh, for I find that electron configuration isn't technically in what they've listed as the NGSS standards, but students who are moving on to either IB or AP chemistry definitely need it. So I tend to uh, put that in as more of an exceeds activity for my students. The last thing is this periodic trends activity. The periodic trends activity you're going through and you're doing, uh, getting some data from, so we have these data sheets that are in uh, Google Docs. And I split people up into different breakout rooms to go through and basically take this data. So like maybe you're the yellow group and you're going to do this data here and then they're going to use that data to put this into uh, this periodic trends uh, google sheets so i'm going to put the google sheets up here and so here's the the main tab because i find that when i put people in a breakout room they forget everything i said about what their instructions are so when they start in this tab it says find the tab that matches your group and you'll see uh, along the bottom, I'm gonna uh, move my bar here, that it says breakout room one, two, three, and it continues out to breakout room eight. Um, and the uh, uh, seven and eight are ionic radiuses, so they have a slightly different instructions. Here's the data that they would need. And they're gonna go through here, and each group is going to put data into this based on there. And you'll see as I add fake data in here, I've got this as view only. So if I was to, when I do this, I'll have to make my own copy. So you'll have to instruct your students to make a copy because we don't want to mess up the main template. template. So once they go in there and they've made their own copy, it'll take a second for it to load the tabs at the bottom. But I want to show you what happens when they enter the data. So as I enter some fake data in a second, you'll see, come on, you'll see that as I, once it loads this up, 
that as I enter fake data, it should go through and automatically graph it uh, on the graph that's there. There's that graph loading finally. And so now you can see that you're getting things for each particular group. And as I add more data, it'll start to add lines, uh, trend lines for that data. And this is showing electronegativity from top to bottom. So uh, that's labeled this because it's going like group two, group three, group four. So as we go down the rows versus the group that does the electronegativity uh, across the rows and it, it specifies and it clarifies that that's the blue one. So once again, I'm gonna enter some fake data and you can see that now we're graphing oops, oops, across the row. So you can see the trend across the row in there. And I put in the top like what specifically those labels are in case they see them. So that's what they're doing. Um, and you can see that those graphs get filled in automatically and then they can copy and paste that into the data discussion when they get to the data discussion. So if I go back into my um, interactive notebook here, which is way, I'm sorry, I've opened so many things. If I go into my interactive notebook for this activity and I scroll all the way down to task set four, you can see that there's also, there's the, student version of the slides, the data that's there. It's also in the other place as well, just to make sure that they don't, uh, that they can find the link. Uh, I know that my students often get frustrated with the ability to find the link. So I overshare links to a lot of different places in order to ensure that that happens. So we'll have one data discussion template. Now, if I go into this data discussion template, the link that I have is a view only link. So what you might wanna do uh, with your interactive notebooks before you share them is create one per class or take that link out and share it in the chat when you do that. Because I believe right now this is in my Zoom window, is, it says request access. So you'll want to do that and you'll want to have one copy for your whole class so that as they go through, they can take those graphs that they've made and they can paste them into this to have that same sort of discussion about similarities and differences and what do things mean. So that's the periodic trends. Um, there is also some sort of ionic radius simulation to help in, uh, give more insight to those students who are doing ionic radius. If you have smaller than eight number of group, than eight groups, you can leave off the ionic radius. It doesn't follow the same trends and it's not really um, the same sort of trend as electronegativity, ionization energy and uh, atomic radius. But the, the one reason we included is that maybe in the back of their minds, it's good for them to keep getting reinforced before they even get into the bonding unit, which is unit four, that metals are gonna be losing electrons and getting smaller and non-metals are gonna be gaining electrons and getting bigger. So that's why that was included in here. Now, once they've done that, um, they'll have their test and I'm gonna give you some uh, resources to help you with that. So uh, I'll show you that restricted teachers folder in a minute so that you can see what's in there and give you some ideas about what's there. So, and then the last thing we have is this jewelry portfolio. So for people who are doing this asynchronously, the jewelry portfolio allows you to do things in an asynchronous manner and you can split people up into groups if you like or have people do it individually. It's a lot of work to do individually. So I recommend splitting people up into groups of about four or five and then having them divide and conquer the work. So I'm gonna show you what that portfolio looks like And once again, when you click on that link, it's going to give you, uh, normally it's gonna give you a version that's going to be view only. Yeah, I'm gonna skip that. So it talks about first uh, about jewelry, uh, pretending like you have your own jewelry company. I talked about earlier about making modifications. I'll be modifying this to say, for my students, I have a wide span of socioeconomic uh, statuses. So I have people who, you know, have parents that work at places like Intel. And I also have students whose parents are, uh, we have about 60% free reduced lunch. So instead of making this, you're gonna start your own jewelry business, uh, I might make this 
you're allowed, you, you've been selected because you're amazing to go to this class where you get a certain budget to make your own jewelry uh, for someone that you care about. So first start, you're gonna start off by brainstorming what kind of jewelry you would make for someone that you care about. And, and that can be individual. And then it talks about different types of jewelry. And then you rank like what's important about those different types of jewelry to help them think about, well, maybe they only had one idea, but that'll give them some different ideas about what they could be making. Um, and then you interview a person uh, that you care about for what kind of jewelry they would like if you were allowed this opportunity. And then you go through and you make an image of that and you start going through and talking about how the different metals react, why they react differently. There's some simulations in here for my chem collective simulation for, this is basically um, activity series simulation people are doing. Then there's another sort of um, activity series simulation where you watch videos on this. So you could have students divide that up. Uh, then it talks about why those things are reacting. You can have them add this data to form decisions and figure out how much you want them to do. Then there's an activity in here about alloys, like if you're mixing things together, like maybe they wanna make something that uh, isn't as expensive as gold, but looks as pretty as gold. So this is talking about what happens when you mix metals together. And um, this mirrors, we talk about mixing metals together as a substitutional alloy, although we don't use those terms because it's a little less sciencey. When we go through and we do our um, periodic trends, because we're trying to figure out like what atom would follow the trends that fits in there to make an alloy. And then they go through and they do some simulations for different alloys. And then it talks about electroplating and how electroplating works and has some simulations and activities around that to go into what would they do for designing their own jewelry. So that's basically the unit. Uh, for those of you, since at least seems like at least one of you are potentially still doing in person, but maybe doing things uh, online and changing, uh, I'm gonna just show you really quickly where these things are. Um, on the Portland Metro STEM Center site. So on the Portland Metro STEM Center site, I have to move my, over here on the right, there's the thing for educators and high school science. And you can see as you scroll down the high school science that there are some chemistry curriculum things, there are the units as we have put them together for distance learning. And there's also materials available for in-person learning if you are still doing that. Okay, I'm gonna go stop sharing for a moment and go back to my, uh, and see if there's any questions before I go back to the slides that I was looking at a minute ago. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna go back to the slides and share my screen again. So we've gone through the unit organizer and the interactive notebook and talked through all of that. I do wanna tell you about some additional things that are available. Uh, so I, I also wanna talk about first this. So I talked about one of the things is an organizer uh, we don't have an organizer currently yet that's created, but this is what mine looks like. I found that while trying to give my students uh, the lessons in Canvas, because all of this is available you can, in the Canvas Commons, there's a Canvas uh, version of this. My students are still struggling with trying to keep track of all of the things that they have. So I, feedback from my students is that they needed an organizer like this in order to link to all of the items. And so you can see on here that I put, I have, two different classes that meet on different days. So uh, I put what date I'm meeting and just links to what task set it is in Canvas, uh, how to turn those task sets in. And so when they become due, I, I make this link active here so they can link on it and make it due. And I kind of keep track of this is as much for me as for them is like, what am I doing on an asynchronous day versus a synchronous day? So what am I doing there to help me keep track of that? I don't know what your districts are doing, but we have a four by four where we're alternating synchronous and asynchronous days. I know several people in the districts are doing that, but some of them are doing things differently. 
so that helps me keep track of it as well as my students. So I'm just recommending that as my students have given me feedback that that's incredibly helpful and they wanted that. Uh, other resources to help you with distance learning is there is this restricted folder of tasks. Uh, I am on the wrong, um, I'm sharing from the wrong place, but there's a restricted folder of tasks that shows where things and has alternate modes of assessment. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second because I have two Google logins and one of my Google logins has access to this and the other one does not. So I'm gonna go and open this in my other Google login so that you can see what that restricted folder is and thus showing you that it is restricted. And there was the, the, my school login which is the one that uh, has access is the, is the one that they've linked to the PMSP course. So what happens is when you take the PMSP classes, they give you access to this restricted folder. This restricted folder has lots of examples of tests that you can use. And so I'm recommending that you want to look in this. So if I go into unit two and you can see that there's a test bank of questions you can look at if you're looking for three-dimensional questions that match this uh, material. There's also keys for a lot of the activities, some pre-assessments if you want to use a pre-assessment, and like a portfolio. So lots of teacher notes in here to help you with what's going on in this activity. Now, one other thing I want to show you in here uh, that's alluded to in the slides, but uh, you require is this assessment options for remote learning. As we're doing this remote learning, a lot of the assessments that we have tried to do may or may not be applicable. So I want you to show you this as an option to think about what are some different assessment uh, potentials that you could try to do. So there's the uh, Go Formative, which is really useful. It gives you a lot of different kinds of question types where students can draw models, uh, do mathematical calculations, answer questions, and you can watch them while they're doing it. So you could have a a go formative test where you're doing it synchronously and you can see them answering questions and give them feedback or uh, see where they're doing things. Other things you could have, other options are things like you could have them do a, a slideshow or a PowerPoint where they have to explain what the phenomena using common language. There's also, uh, you know, uniquely worded questions that would deal with a specific cross cutting concept with a specific scenario there where you're having them use things here. So anyway, there's a lot of different resources in here that you can look for in order to improve tests, because I know that one of the things that has come up in these webinars before is how are we going to manage uh, cheating in a distance learning scenario. And there's a lot of options and ideas in here for how to make things non googleable answers that require them to understand the content. So I just wanted to show you that that's available as well. And once again, that's just in that restricted folder, which if I stop sharing and I go back to the PMSP website, and go back to sharing. When I navigated to here, I just kind of went to the PMSP website, went to educators. So here's all the patterns, chemistry materials there's that restricted patterns chemistry folder that gives you all of that information. And then um, I already showed you that uh, example, go formative, and I can show you how to do that here. So uh, some other tips and tricks that have come up as we've gone into deeper into uh, doing this. Some students have requested that we break up the interactive notebook by task set. Please let them know that if you do that, that they'll want all task sets for that unit in order to study for the test. But uh, I've had students who say that the full interactive notebook is too much for their um, phone that they're doing a lot of the interactive work on. Uh, I showed you the organizer to have links to the learning modules or activities there so that uh, if your students are as organized as my students, they will constantly be asking you about links and modules and that reduces both the work on you because they can find the stuff and it allows them more access to the, the lessons. Um, embed methods of judging engagement into lessons uh, at PPS where you can use Nearpod for that. If you're not at PPS, I recommend using the formative for that. And if you 
uh, need more assistance on doing that, how to put something together informative, uh, we can work on that through PMSP or something. Because that's a free option is formative allows you to check for understanding and you can drop a link for the formative with the code already into the chat and then allow multiple methods of assessment. So that's what I've got there. Okay, so that was the full overview. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and give you uh, a few minutes to sort of collaborate on what you think. So if you'd like to unmute at this time and let me know if you need me to stop recording while we're doing that, uh, for what kind of collaboration you might need to do in order to make some of this your own. I'm not hearing anyone. I'm going to pause the 